Shove it, squad. Are you all ready for a little SEX? I know I sure am. This stupid lockdown has damaged my love life. There's nothing like when you've got that one bird you've been flying after for months. You can't get her legs out of your mind. And finally, you get her back to your nest and wham! Hold it right there, lover bird. We ain't talking about the sex you were thinking of. No, no. In fact, it's quite the opposite. And it involves Vince Russo. Heck, that changes your thought process. Before we start today's video, I want to get a bit of a discussion going. Has your opinion on Vince Russo changed at all in the last year? I'm starting to see more support for him on the internet than I'm used to. Or do you still think he's the worst thing that ever happened to wrestling? From my perspective, as bad as some of his ideas and storylines are, and yes, today's video is an example of that, I like having things to laugh at. I mean, funny is entertaining for me, and even if they're not meant to be funny, I miss them. I miss the storyline-driven wrestling shows. Also, keep watching for AJ Styles with a chainsaw. The proudest moment of AJ's wrestling career. Anyway, it's Vince Russo's Sports Entertainment Extreme Faction. Sex sells. Get it, got it, shove it. This was the first major storyline in TNA Wrestling. Guess what, it was a faction invading storyline. It certainly set the pace for future storylines and changed the direction of the company. TNA was a real mixture for the first 15 or so episodes. Amazing wrestling matches mixed in with some of the strangest segments of wrestling history. TNA would have a lot of faction invading storylines in the future, but this one today was the granddaddy of them all. The whole idea behind the faction was it would be reality based. The promos would not be planned out at all. Russo says when it was time for a segment involving him, he would go and hide in the car park and sneak into the building. When it was his time to be on telly, he would show up without warning. This was to capture the wrestlers' true reactions to things that were happening. Unfortunately, it only seemed like Mike Tanay reacted properly. Because you're listening to the Hawk talk, it all started off with who else but Slapnuts. He'd been chasing the NWA heavyweight title for most of 2002. He finally had a shot against Truth, but he couldn't seem to put him away. A white f***ing hoodie man called Mr Wrestling Free had been appearing in TNA before this, and he would interfere here and help Jarrett win the belt from Truth. He smashed him with a guitar. What would you expect, a f***ing glass hammer? This would be very appropriate for Jeff in TNA, as almost all of his matches ended with a guitar. The masked man then revealed himself to be Vince Russo. <laughs> He seemed to want to be friends with Jeff Jarrett. Russo was already working behind the scenes as a booker, but now he would be having a TV role. He introduced himself as the Antichrist of professional wrestling. Dude, I was watching the TNA thing the other day, and this dude, Vince Russo, he stole my Antichrist gimmick, man. I'll go back to Carolina, I'll go tell my stolen friend, and we go get you, man. Russo immediately started going on a shoot tirade. He spoke about how he gave Jeff Jarrett his guitar and how unhappy Jeff was at being asked to lose to China in 1999. Russo then admits that TNA didn't stand for total non-stop action and instead it stood for something else. I gave that moron the name TNA, but TNA didn't mean total non-stop action. TNA meant an ass, no. This product sucks. The WWE sucks, and Vince Russo is here to save the day once again. Russo asked Jarrett to join him as there was a big change coming to TNA. Truth would rematch Jarrett, but Jeff would win after refusing Russo's help and hitting the stroke three times on Truth. In true TNA fashion, Russo demanded an answer from Jeff on if he would join him. He asked for an answer tonight, but then the show goes off the air. Ha ha. Well, that's typical TNA, isn't it? I guess we'll have to wait till next week for the answer. We certainly got something on the next show. Roddy Piper turned up in TNA and he immediately interrogated Russo about Owen Hart's death. Something might surprise you. It would turn out that Jarrett was not with Vince Russo after all. Well, grab your f***ing necks and shove it down your throats. Road Dogg's dad is Bullet Bob. He's the disgusting, mouldy authority figure at the time. He looked really old and he was really, really grey and boring. This proved it was fair when people spoke about NWA being stuck in the past and being old fashioned. So that's why Russo was going against them. Russo polled the crowd on what they wanted to see in their wrestling and they all wanted sex. So Russo says that we're about to witness the birth of sports entertainment extreme. Randomly Russo starts acknowledging ring girl Athena who was extremely popular in the asylum. Despite that TNA would never put her on TV for some reason. He brought her into the ring and told her to show her boobs to the crowd. It was a very strange and uncomfortable segment with Russo calling her ugly over and over again. 
It didn't help that TNA never explained who she was prior to this. He might as well have said, here's this extremely popular girl that none of you at home have ever heard of. Just explain her backstory, then it'll make sense. It got even uglier when the Nazi twins aligned themselves with Russo. These were the first two guys to join the faction. Ugh, I don't want to watch this. Not starting off well, is it? They hit Athena with the H-bomb twice. That old fossil, you know, Bullet Bob, he asked them why they did this and then tells them that they won't be fired because he'd prefer to punish them in the ring. It's not starting out well for Russo's faction, and it went even worse for Vince Russo's faction when they lost what was essentially a handicap situation against Jeff Jarrett. I think he needs some new guys. Well, it wouldn't be waiting long because that same night BG James smashed Truth of a chair and joined Russo. Then Paul Bearer randomly turned up. The former road dog, now BG James, was the mouthpiece when Russo wasn't around. He said him and Russo were responsible for DX. After a few more weeks, three more guys were added to SEX. Kurt Henning was jumped by Skipper, Daniels and Low Key. Whilst this was going on, Road Dog was on commentary doing a JR impression. Low Key especially has been a big fan favourite up to this point. It seems like a strange move to put him in this heel group. It was explained shortly after that Loki was being forced to work a heavy schedule by NWA, so he wanted to join SEX. Daniels joined because NWA couldn't afford to keep flying him in for California, and Skipper joined because he asked for a pay rise but TNA wouldn't do it, so Russo agreed to get him laid twice a day. That was enough to get him to join. The show then started to dramatically change. The amount of wrestling reduced for the first time, and the in-ring segments increased. Around this time, Jeff Jarrett, the ultimate good guy, tried to take down Sports Entertainment Extreme, but he was outnumbered. The next man to join the faction was David Flair, for f**k's sake. He snuck into the ring and attacked Kurt Henning with an axe handle. For those of you who have been living under a rock or are just plain stupid, I've been doing a series called Ring of the Hawk, where I watch every match of a wrestler. I did Kurt Henning's run, and his final match was against David Flair in an axe handle on the pole match. And let me tell you something. That match can shove it, it's one of the worst of all time. Anyway, getting back on track, Russo wasn't anywhere near done as a woman called Desire debuted. She then helped Sonny Siaki capture the X Division title, and Russo then used her to convince Sonny to join SEX. He said that she would do any sexual acts he wanted. He said Sonny had all the potential to be a massive star. Well, considering this faction was meant to be reality based, that whole thing with her is going to come true soon. That same night, it looked like AJ Styles had joined the group because he attacked Jeff Jarrett in a giant brawl. Russo ended the show that night by destroying the entire TNA set to show how in control his group are at this point. It had been two months and it was now January. Russo revealed that he was still allowed to be here because he had friends in high places. He continued the shoot type promos. Some of them were actually the most energetic promos on the show. Even if you didn't agree with what he was saying, it was still interesting to listen to. He carried on preaching wrestling revolution and he went against the old fossils and said he didn't care about their history because they were old and making the show look bad. Christ, he sounds like the Hawk on the NWA reviews. Loki, Skipper and Daniels were often teamed up and the group became known as Triple X. They were a popular part of early TNA, so that's something good that's come out of SEX. Even if Jarrett did beat all three of them in the same night, he can shove it. The Road Warriors then randomly joined the fight as they didn't like Russo. Styles continued to be teased as a member, but he never seemed to hang out with the guys. Next to join the faction was beyond boring Mike Sanders, I'm going to f fall asleep, who said he'd been hired by Vince Russo to scout the best wrestlers for the group. It takes one to know one, by the way, Mike. Unfortunately, he would be a major part of this setup. The faction continued to be booked weekly as Dusty Rhodes debuted in TNA and took out the entire faction on his own. Russo's next claim was that he created The Undertaker and he had his entire faction beat up Paul Bearer. SEX continued assisting Styles in his matches, but he continued to not officially be aligned with them. Things started getting really strange when Nikita Kolov, dressed as Mr. Wrestling 4, interfered in a match, taking out Dusty Rhodes. The problem was that as strong as Russo was on the mic, his guys weren't getting any experience in talking. Russo literally did everything. Well, except for one guy. One guy that no one wanted to hear from. Beyond boring Mike Sanders, he quickly scouted and signed a wrestler to Sports Entertainment Extreme. This is Ashley Hudson, who's billed as an Australian champion. He lives up to every single Australian wrestling stereotype that you could possibly imagine, just shoved all over him. Don't get too used to seeing him, folks. He'll be gone after this show and done with wrestling entirely. Oh, Ashley Hudson, I don't know who you are, but I'm sure if I did, I'd have told everyone that you suck. 
Sanders tried to recruit Jorge Estrada because he liked the flying Elvises, but he didn't seem too keen. Sports Entertainment Extreme would add more gold to the group as Loki and Skipper captured the tag titles from AMW. Don't get too excited, they needed constant interference to help them win, and it didn't give them any credibility. It was happy days for the faction though, as they held a party in the back. A common trend of this group were the films of the sports entertainment locker room. This room seemed to be a little tiny square located at the back of the arena. It was almost a broom cupboard. It was literally a disgustingly painted room with one toilet cubicle. It must have stank like in there. As for Nikita Kolov, he was asked to decide if he was going to side with NWA or SEX, and he answered that by smacking Dusty Rhodes one. But then he disappeared for a month, so I guess he didn't join SEX. That same night, Jarrett defended his title against SEX in a match that any normal man would have lost, but not Slapnuts. However, after his win, he was attacked by a debuting Raven, who was clearly with Russo and SEX. Raven even went as far as stealing his belt. Jesus, how many members is that now? I think I've lost count, like 20 I think? Let's recap. Russo, the Nazi twins, BG James, Low Key, Daniel, Skipper, Sonny Siaki, Desire, David Flair, Beyond Boring, Mike Sanders. It's not the most exciting list in the world, is it? Raven put Jarrett for a table and he continued to keep hold of the title. Estrada eventually turned down Mike Sanders and then Disco Inferno joined the group attacking him with a steel chair. Mike Sanders introduced him as the Director of Talent Development. What's that? 12 people now. You might have expected BG James to be mentioned more, but he was too distracted by feuding with his mouldy family, so he's a bit of a non-factor in this group. In fact, at some point he just disappears and stops hanging around with them, and then he moves on to better things of his old WWE friends. SEX were giving Harris and Storm a lesson in group sex, and then the Rock and Roll Express debuted in TNA. Then they hit Harris and Storm with a steel chair and joined SEX. 15 guys. Aren't these guys the exact thing Russo wanted to get away from? It makes no sense. Why would Russo want to hang around with these two old fossils? SEX seemed to completely derail Truth and Lynn, by the way, who were main eventers prior to this. Now Truth was doing the J.O.B. to beyond boring Mike Sanders. Then Tony Schiavone turned up dressed like a cokehead. He complained that he's not had a job in wrestling for two years. It's probably due to that coke problem. He talks about how he hung out with the wrestlers in the 80s. Then he starts arguing with Mike Tanay while the crowd chant boring. Russo comes out and offers Tony Schiavone a job. Great, so now we've got two decrepit old announcers feuding, two almost crippled wrestlers from the 80s beating young TNA talents, and we've got Road Dog feuding with his OAP dad and mold brother. This isn't really going well. Well, I needn't have worried because Tony Schiavone and the Rockers were both gone within a couple of shows, so they were completely pointless. Jeff Jarrett was then kidnapped by SEX wearing army gear. They all just turned up one week dressed like this for no reason. Russo then gave Disco Inferno a task. Because he was in charge of character development, he asked him to help make Jeff Jarrett a better wrestler. He said he wanted him to do nothing but swear and think about tits and ass. That same night, Triple X lost the titles after one of the worst botches I've ever seen. It was supposed to be a double pin where they couldn't decide a winner. Instead, one referee had to wait for the other to count the three. By the way, I think they dress like army men because the show ends with a 15 minute war. But why cover their faces? Are they too ugly? My question was answered minutes later. The whole point in this was so at the end of the show, Jarrett could reveal himself to be under a mask and beat up everyone. A wild slap nuts appeared. Bullet Bob was then replaced as the director of authority by another old grey relic, JJ Dillon, and Russo was extra livid about this. Honestly, why would new fans want to hear about Russo's hatred of Kevin Sullivan and JJ Dillon? Nobody could care about these guys. So the storyline wasn't going well, and it was made worse as Sonny Siaki lost his X Division title to Kid Cash, who despite botching the finish, still made it look awesome. Disco was starting to get angry with Mike Sanders, because everyone was, because he's Mike Sanders, he's really annoying. His problem that Mike was not bringing him any wrestlers to develop. Disco was desperately thumbing through magazines for men who swing that way in search of new talent. Mike Sanders was so swarmy and punchable this whole time. Jarrett continued to beat down the entire faction on his own. It had been months at this point, it was clear that Styles was not a member. Instead he was just friends with Russo and he wanted to take Jeff's belt away. After two months of being employed by SEX, Disco finally developed a wrestler's character. He introduced us to a drug addict, adulterer who died a fat obese slob. Ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce you to Disgraceland. We're now up to 16 wrestlers. He's an obese man who takes breaks during the match to eat peanut butter and banana sandwiches. Mike Tanay's flipping out on commentary. He complains that Glenn Gilberti's ideas in WCW consisted of the Invisible Man and a group of Martian wrestlers led by Mike Sanders. <laughs> you would think a person like this would be booked to lose, 
but Disgraceland actually wins. Next up, Vince Russo pays an unwanted visit to Jeff Jarrett's family home. Unfortunately, none of this was on camera, but instead we got to hear about how Russo stayed up all night cuddling and kissing Jeff. This didn't actually happen, by the way. The conclusion is that apparently Russo managed to convince Jarrett to sign for SEX. Guess what? That didn't happen either. It's been about four months now, and this faction isn't even living up to its name. It's not very entertaining. It's certainly not extreme. In fact, I'm surprised by the lack of TNA. Russo's friendship with AJ started to cause friction with Raven, who was supposed to be Russo's main eventer. Suddenly, SEX added two new members to the faction as the Hotshots randomly joined. For those of you who don't know, the Hotshots are famous for a few things. Squeezing their junk, losing, and looking like a young CM Punk in a depressed version of Shane Douglas. Sonny Siaki was now calling himself the ace in the hole, and he tried to boss everyone around in the locker room. They pretty much hated him. Russo's real kids were now brought into the storyline, as they were on camera saying what a bad dad Russo is and that he's never at home. Russo got very emotional and says that when he gets home he's going to beat their asses. And this is where the faction dies. Well, not straight away. It dies a very slow, drawn-out death. These might seem like just the first cracks, but trust me, the house just came down. David Flair left the group without an announcement as he joined Generation Next, a group consisting of Eric Watts and Grandmaster Sexe. It's crazy to think that there were two such bad factions existing at the same time in TNA. Russo was absent from TV for the next week and was emotional about what his kids had said, and the group started to bicker without a leader. Nobody knew at the time, but Russo wasn't really coming back. His association with the group was done. Basically. You'll see why later on. With Russo gone, eventually wrestlers did start listening to Sonny Siaki, even though they were much more experienced than him. The Hot Shots then got into a brawl with the Nazi twins, literally a week after they joined SEX, and now they're gone. Disgraceland was gone the next week after Siaki took Disco and Sanders away from a match they are watching, and he was left on his own. So after that loss, that's the last time you see Disgraceland. But then Disco introduced us to his latest creation called Hollywood. He literally ditched Disgraceland on the same show, it's ridiculous. The whole faction were just a bunch of bad-tempered losers, and the whole of sports entertainment extreme had a mass brawl. This was caused by Sonny Siaki bossing Sanders around, even though he's proven to be a completely useless and beyond boring. Desire stood up for a man and the new lady Hollywood attacked her. It eventually got broken up. The karma heads in the situation were the Nazi brothers. Christ, you know you're in trouble when these two are the peacekeepers. Siaki continued to try and take control of SEX and he tried to recruit D'Lo Brown into the group. This was supposed to be the job of beyond boring Mike Sanders. D'Lo refused and smacked Sonny one because he kept making fun of D'Lo's WWE gimmicks. Nobody comes to Sonny's rescue and he's a bit upset about this. Back in the locker room, no one cared either, and Sonny continued to have problems with Beyond Boring. Then suddenly Disco Inferno stepped up and delivered a powerful speech. He also told Daniels and Loki to stop disappearing to Japan. Well, I did wonder where they keep going. There was some good news for the group though, as Triple X recovered their vacant tag titles by cheating, and there was finally gold back in the camp. Disco continued developing characters and issued an open challenge to any girl willing to show their ass in a match against Hollywood. She ended up fighting cage dancer Lollipop, whose boob falls out, and it's all blurred. It's obvious these two are not trained wrestlers. Suddenly, Hollywood rips her top off and Jay Bree sprints over to cover her whilst he does his giant bug eyes. Finally, some actual TNA on this show. This was honestly the first time this has happened, which is crazy for a faction named Sex. They just aren't really doing anything that affects major storylines anymore, they just kind of exist. Raven's a main eventer, but he's barely even with them. He spends more time with his ECW guys. Disco continues to try and recruit D'Lo for the group, due to their friendships with Vince Russo, and from this it's clear that Disco is now in charge of the group. Despite the masses of TV time they were getting, they lost most of their matches. I'm talking, they literally got four segments a show. Hollywood continued to provide the TNA for the group, and Disco Inferno started humiliating her and talking to her like Vince McMahon in a Trish Stratus storyline. And what the hell are you doing, you little s***? You're supposed to be the f***ing ass of sports entertainment stream and that's air. Oh, big deal. Last week you got some stripper to show her boobs. I want you to get out there and show us Athena's boobs. You got that? Raven beat Styles in a ladder match after Disco interfered to help Raven and he powerbombed Styles for a table out of the ring. This then led to the best moment of SEX. After Goldilocks finished singing America the Beautiful, AJ Styles was shown running through the arena with a chainsaw. He kicked SEX's door in and then made lots of hilarious threats that ended with the infamous moment of AJ Styles calling Disco Inferno a homophobic slur. I love this segment so much, it's so stupid. Why did they give him a chainsaw? Why does he sound so unthreatening? The look of pure shock on all their faces. This might have been one of those segments that Russo spoke about at the start that nobody knew was going to happen. 
Poor Disco. I honestly can't understand why this thing even exists without Russo. It makes even less sense. What's their goal? Why do they exist? Why doesn't the NWA have a problem with them anymore? None of this was explained and the storyline just continued without Russo. They desperately tried to cling to Dino Brown and made a deal that he would join them if they helped him win the world title from Slapnuts, but they were unsuccessful. Anyway, because Jarrett is the champion, you know how it goes. Say it all with me now. Fights an entire faction off on his own. Ref bump, stroke, Jarrett wins. He also hits Mickey James with a chair shot, so it has that going for it. So D'Lo won't be joining their group. Chris Harris was often seen in the SEX locker room, and it was teased for a while that he was joining them. Storm wasn't happy about this. They always wanted to push Harris on his own, but back in the day they never pulled that trigger on that solo run. He does tell Beyond Boring some home truths, which was hilarious. Nobody likes you over there. Chris, do you really think I give a sh what boys in that locker room like me? Let me ask you. Let me ask you, what do you think about Mike Sanders? What's your opinion of Mike Sanders? Honest? Honest? Don't mind. I think you're an asshole. <laughs> uh, exactly. You think I'm an asshole. AJ would eventually get his hands on Disco Inferno, and of course, because Disco's an SEX wrestler, he lost. Suddenly, with no introduction, it's Bart Gunn who's in SEX with no explanation. He's talking about the Brawl for All, which was relevant a few years before this. He has one match, a loss to Perry Saturn, and then he's gone. Thanks for coming, Bart Gunn. The final nail was put in the coffin in April, as an obese ex-cab driver, David Young, turned on his friend Athena and joined SEX. Because that's what this faction needed. A completely irrelevant jobber who's been doing nothing, zero, zilch, not worth a single hawk feather. Raven was still failing in capturing the world title, so Disco Inferno decided that he would take a go. Plus, Raven didn't even know if he was in SAX anymore. He seemed to be more interested in his ECW buddies. Disco entered a gauntlet match and eliminated AJ Styles. Yes, you heard that right. It came down to Disco and Sabu, and then Raven interfered and DDT'd Sabu. So Disco won the match. So we finally have a legit, constant SEX member getting a push, and it's Disco Inferno. Is this the badass main event you'd all hope for? That same night, a young Chris Saban captured the X Division belt with help from Triple X, and he joined the group. They also tried to recruit Julio De Niro and a goofy young Mickey James, but only lasted for about a week before they preferred to side with Raven. They built up Disco for weeks to challenge for Jeff Jarrett's world title. Disco even got a win over Raven after... Vince Russo returned and hit Raven with a bat. Okay, I'm interested now. This might have some energy going for it. So SEX now have a chance to own all the belts in TNA. It was a main event that we were all supposed to take seriously. Jeff Jarrett versus Disco Inferno for the world title. Well, you know how this goes. Ref bump, Russo then turns on Disco and he hits him with a bat. And then Jarrett hits the stroke and it's over. Out of the blue, Russo turned on his own team. Russo leaves through the SEX area of the arena and they're so useless they don't even try to stop him. What a bunch of losers. So why did Russo turn on his boys? Well it was a week later and he helped AJ Styles capture his first world title. So it seemed that Russo could see that SEX was a sinking ship and AJ Styles was on the rise. And they planted the seeds a long time ago that him and AJ were friends. The faction struggled along for a little while longer with Triple X dropping the belts to AMW. The same night Disco Inferno then announced that they were no longer allowed to use the SEX name. Somehow it cooled on for a couple more weeks again before ending without any official announcements. The losers all just went their own way and most of them continued losing. Disco formed a new group called the New York Connection which was even less entertaining. The Nazi boys were relegated to the TNA B show explosion before leaving that year. Mike Sanders would leave TNA straight away with no proper comeuppance. Considering how smarmy and whiny he'd been, he deserved to get smacked out. Siaki would wrestle for a couple more years in TNA having plenty of matches, but he would never have as much attention as he got during the SEX run, and he'd never get to live up to the potential that Vince Russo said that he had. And this was all because he had to donate his other kidney to his brother and retire from wrestling. Sonny's manager, Desire, broke her back the same month that the angle ended. She'd finish up wrestling in 2004 after not wanting to bump anymore and becoming pregnant with a third child. Sonny Siaki is the dad of that child, for real. 
So there's something positive that came out of the SEX angle. She then put on a load of weight and ballooned to 252 pounds. Jeez, that's heavier than I am. And then she lost half of it by going on the biggest loser. And I ain't talking about sports entertainment extreme. Triple X didn't gain much from a character perspective, but all three guys would have a place in TNA for a while. They were established from their time in SEX as three guys who worked well together and could have a good match of anyone. If anything, it gave them more of a purpose other than just taking it in turns challenging for the X belt. Plus, I mean, come on. David Young, Mike Sanders, the Nazis. I mean, these guys were always going to do better than their colleagues. Well, that's it. I was expecting this faction to be an NWO ripoff. It wasn't. I don't think they were trying to take over the company. They started off just trying to change it so that it was more about the younger guys with a different mentality. In fact, after Russo left, I have no idea what their aim was. I guess you could compare this more to New Blood in WCW. Unfortunately, it was just a collection of mainly their most boring wrestlers shoved in one little room in the back of the arena, with Raven drifting in and out of the storyline. This group had no permanent main eventer. Who was the highest singles wrestler in the group? Disco Inferno? Sonny Siaki? And I like Sonny, I do, but this wasn't working for him, and I don't think it was meant to either. Ultimately, the biggest problem with this faction was that it was supposed to be about leaving tradition in the past, but Russo spent more time cutting shoot promos about things that happened in WCW and WWE five years earlier, and talking about the wrestling audience that left after the Attitude Era. And then it dragged on for way longer than you can imagine for no good reason after Russo left. And if you don't agree with that, I'll remove you like a pest.